The Australian Labour Party's Anthony Albanese has been elected as the nation's prime minister. Albanese originally came from the left of the party, though ran a centrist campaign. And in his victory speech, he brought up his working class background. It says a lot about our great country that the son of a single mum who was a disability pensioner who grew up in public housing down the road in Camperdown. can stand before you tonight as Australia's Prime Minister. Albanese defeated the right-wing Liberal National Coalition, whose share of seats collapsed. You can see Labour have reached the 76 seats needed for a majority. That's eight up on the last time around. And the Liberal National Coalition have lost 18 seats, down to 59. The losing Libnat campaign was headed by Scott Morrison, the incumbent prime minister. Morrison is a right-wing anti-migrant zealot who's been one of the most vociferous opponents of climate action. This was his concession speech. I've always believed in Australians and their judgment, and I've always been prepared to accept their verdicts. And tonight they have delivered their verdict. And I congratulate Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party, and I wish him and his government all the very best. A statement like that should not be notable, but after Donald Trump tried to steal his election, it's hard to know how far Murdoch-backed right-wingers will go. Of course, the biggest ballast for the right in Australia is Rupert Murdoch, but some from the Australian Labor Party seem to have successfully called his bluff. This is how former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd engaged with a Murdoch-owned Sky News Australia during the campaign. I would assume that you guys in the Murdoch media would find any piece of dirt on any Labor candidate anywhere in the country. But she tweeted it. To have a go. She tweeted it. No, but I know what you guys are like. But she tweeted it, though. That's right, but you'll do anything anything that Rupert says to undermine Labor. No, we won't. No, no, no. It's a question I have, Mr. I think everyone, I think everyone here agrees with me. <laughs> no, no, that's a question from me. So can I ask you, Mr. Rudd, though, while, while I have you live on Sky News, are you are you hopeful of a new of a role with an a- a- Albanese Labor government if he's elected? Are you hopeful of maybe an ambassadorship? Um, again, I can always rely upon you people to pose questions I've already answered, and the answer to that is no, and you know that. Um, and furthermore, if you guys had any soft respect at the Murdoch media, you would start adopting something approaching balanced coverage. Am I right? Yeah. We're here trying to speak to you and, and obviously the candidate. I'm just, I spoke with Michelle yeah, a little bit earlier. But you're a tool for Murdoch. Keir Starmer, I hope you're watching. And another lesson Starmer could learn, Labour didn't win this alone. And in fact, their vote share fell compared to the last federal elections in 2019. As you can see, they're down one percentage point and they remain on a lower share than the Liberals or the Liberal National Coalition. But what got Labour over the line was second preference votes from independents and the Greens. The Greens, with 12% of the vote, had their best election ever. To find out more about the Aussie elections, I spoke to Tom Ballard, a comedian who hosts the Serious Danger podcast, which has covered the election from the perspective of the Greens. I started by asking whether Saturday's vote shows Australia has moved decisively to the left. In a way, yes. I mean, I sure hope so. That's that's for sure. Pretty extraordinary result. The Tory, the Conservative government, the coalition lost 17 seats. Um including some really high-profile people. The treasurer lost his seat. Um, Some real libertarian psychos lost their seats. We love to see that. Um, Some social conservatives lost their seats, and particularly in these massive heartland seats, these seats that have been in liberal, that's our conservative party, hands for ever since Federation, have gone to these what are called teal independents, these Basically, they're disaffected liberals. They're people who, you know, maybe 10 years ago would have voted for the Liberal Party and happily run as liberal candidates who were just sick to death of this conservative government's stance on climate change, uh, on integrity and on their attitudes to women. So they ran these independent campaigns. They weren't specific parties, but they were individual candidates and they fully beat them and trounced them, which was great. The Greens, the party that I uh, quite like, uh, increased their representation by 400%. And of course, the Labour Party won a government. It looked like it might have been a minority government, but it looks like they're on track to actually get a a majority uh, seat. So that is fantastic. The general wisdom is Australian politics is sort of deals within the centre. We have compulsory voting across the board. So that's sort of a factor. And there are plenty of horrible positions that our Labour Party has taken, which I'm sure that you can uh, relate to in the UK. But overwhelmingly, this felt like a rejection and a shift to the left, in the centre left of the left, in a lot of really very cool ways. So thumbs up to that. 
On one level, is it a disappointment if the Labour Party get an absolute majority? That presumably will mean parties like the Greens have less influence. Yes, the, the strategy from the Greens generally was to have more influence in on the crossbench, to get a minority Labour government and have a whole bunch of Greens MPs there so that we could push the Labour Party further and faster, particularly on climate action and on, you know, lifting poor people out of poverty, you know, actual good things that you would think the Labour Party would be on board with. Uh, that strategy has... I mean, it's worked out very well for the Greens in terms of increasing their representation. But yes, with the Labor Party, with a majority in the lower house, they will form government and will be able to introduce legislation as a majority of themselves. That was also the strategy of those teal independents. They were hoping to, you know, pack the crossbench so that they could influence the government. Looks like they will have way less influence than you would think, even though they did pick up a whole bunch of seats amongst them. But in the Senate, in the upper house, the state's house, that is where the Greens have formed a big part of the crossbench. That's where the party will have some serious influence. The Labor Party says they're not budging at all on their climate targets of a reduction of 43% by 2030, even though that puts us on track to two degrees of warming. Um, but certainly this vote sort of says that's bullshit. you gotta, you got to do better than that, my friends. you got to raise the bar, God damn it. And that's what we'll be pushing for, yeah. Uh, and what does this election result mean in terms of climate change? I mean, obviously, f from people outside Australia, one of the most significant outcomes could be that Australia stops being that block to climate action that it that it has been. You're suggesting they won't necessarily take a leading role, but w will they stop dragging their heels when it comes to, for example, international climate agreements? That's certainly the pitch, right? So Labor ran on the idea of ending the climate wars. And this has been an issue that in Australia, which, well, you know, we make up a small amount of the world's total emissions were massive per capita emitters, particularly when you count in all the emissions from the stuff that we dig up and sell overseas and they burn and that cooks the planet. We're extremely good at that. And the capital forces involved in that obviously love donating to our political parties and wielding political influence. So yes, over the past decade or more than that, certainly it has been a pretty toxic issue in Australian politics and the Labor, is, Labor Party is selling this as an end to all the climate wars. Now, again, with those unambitious unambitious targets in my view, uh, I feel like this issue is going to keep coming up and be a big deal, particularly if the now defeated Liberal National Coalition, as seems to be the way, uh, are planning on moving further to the right. They're sort of reading this result as a chance for them to double down, to say, forget about all that climate change nonsense and, and carry on. So that'll be an interesting way that plays out. But certainly the Albanese Labor government is saying that, you know, this this is it. We're actually going to take action on climate change now. We're going to become a renewable energy superpower. So it's certainly, you know, it's good news on that front. Yeah. And Australia is potentially the only country where Rupert Murdoch is more influential than he is in, in the UK. To what extent can this result be seen as a rebuke to, to him and his media organisations? Uh, look, I love it. I love it. It's a little bit, I wouldn't, I don't want to say it's Corbyn in 2017 vibes, but certainly... And I was just watching the, on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC, there was just a program called Media Watch, which is yeah, a 15 minute show where they just basically dissect media politics over the past week. And they just did this great special showing that the Murdoch media empire went as hard as possible to keep the Conservatives in. Josh, Josh Frydenberg, the treasurer, had a front page spread on the Herald Sun in Melbourne that was literally headlined, why you should vote for me. And it had a two page like colour spread on the inside. Like Rupert did all that he possibly could. He went really hard. And Australians said no. Now, to be fair, the Labor Party still played the Murdoch game. The Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, did a front page of the Daily Telegraph in Sydney, sort of saying, I'm not a woking class hero. I'm a working class hero you know, playing along the game with transphobic questions like, can men have babies? He said, no, all that kind of disgusting bullshit. Um, but certainly the diminishing influence of the print media generally and certainly of um, Rupert Media stuff is very encouraging, particularly watching Sky News' coverage uh, on election night. Our Sky News is even further to the right than, than I think the British one and seeing all those losers cry. That was, um, that was a wonderful time in everyone's lives, yeah. Albanese hasn't taken the same approach as, as Kevin Rudd because we often see here videos we've shown them before we've shown one one today of Kevin Rudd really being very confrontational when it comes to the Murdoch owned press is, is that not necessarily the stance of the Labour Party as a whole that certainly hasn't been Albanese's strategy I mean Kevin Rudd again got the endorsement basically you know played the Murdoch game back in 2007 when he was elected as prime minister I think it's fair to say and sort of courted that Murdoch endorsement and Murdoch certainly got on board towards the end when it seemed like the Howard government was over and that Rudd was pretty pretty a uh, pretty good chance he has since developed this whole 
anti-Murdoch analysis. He's called for a royal commission into the Murdoch media empire and organized a petition, which got like about half a million signatures or something like that. Albanese was very careful to distance himself from that. He sort of said, hey, look, the media is the media and you can't complain about it. You've got to just deal with it and move on. Um, and he would regularly write opinion pieces in the Daily Telegraph, for example, which, again, I think is a reasonable strategy if you want to try and talk to as many people as you possibly can when you're running to be prime minister. Uh, whether, yes, the Labor Party will ever get on board officially in government with the idea of a royal commission into the Murdoch media um, empire remains to be seen. But I think, particularly with the appalling and atrocious behaviour of the media across this election, everyone is pretty keen for some media reform pretty soon, please. All of us here at Navarra Media are working harder than ever to keep scrutinising establishment politicians and the media barons who protect them. We don't have billionaire funders. We don't have advertising partnerships. We're funded entirely by you. If you've ever thought about supporting us, now's the time to go to navarramedia.com slash support and donate anything you can from just one pound per month. Defy the corporate media. Join our monthly supporters and help build our supporter base to 10,000 strong. 